keep on going and uh, move on to our final speaker, uh, Mr. Paul Hilton. So uh, Paul has had an extensive career as a urogynecology consultant and clinical academic focusing on incontinence, prolapse and urogenital fistulas, uh, including experience in a global women's health as a visiting faculty at a fistula clinic in Nigeria and Uganda. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Katrina. Um, are the slides showing there already? Yes. Excellent. And can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I yep. can. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kat, for the uh, invitation and uh, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be able to join you. I've been listening in intently to Ganesh and Emma. And I hope uh, you would agree that you've had a great afternoon already. Um, I don't want to extend it any further than, uh, than we have to, recognising that we're well on into uh, Saturday afternoon now. Um, but Emma had asked me to speak about uh, fistula um, from both clinical and research point of view, and uh, I'm always happy to, to do that. Um, as she mentioned, my experience of fistula has been both in, in the UK, particularly in the northeast of England, and in a number of African countries, Uganda and Nigeria in particular. Uh, so in, uh, in my talk, what I will try to do is sort of uh, compare and contrast, if you like, fistula as we see them uh, here and as they're seen in uh, low and middle income, uh, low and middle income countries. I don't have any uh, interest to declare. Um, I should give you a short uh, warning though. Uh, fistula certainly can be a particularly emotive uh, subject at times, uh, and certainly some of the images that I'll be showing uh, may be a little bit upsetting to some of you. I uh, uh, apologize for that. It is the, the nature of the condition, unfortunately, but I'm sure you know how to switch me off if you feel the need to, to do that. Okay, um, well, let's just kick off with some uh, uh, headline uh, figures um, to slightly misquote uh, anchorman uh, Ron Burgundy. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. Um, but what is the big deal about fistula? Uh, well, currently it's estimated that over 3 million women worldwide have an untreated fistula. 95% of those live in low income countries. Wherever you live with a fistula, it has a pretty dramatic impact on your quality of life. But in low income countries in particular, it may be associated not infrequently uh, with divorce by your husband, with uh, ostracism from uh, your community, having to live on the fringes of society, um, often unable to uh, uh, make a living other than by subsistence farming or uh, resorting to sex work. So it is a big deal for affected individuals. And it's a big deal for the world at large. Um, <clears throat> setting aside global pandemics, um, cervix cancer and pregnancy, itself, uh, this is probably the biggest uh, public health issue uh, that we have to deal with within the specialty. Now, what I hope to try and, and cover within the session is to uh, uh, discuss the nature and causes of urogenital fistula, uh, to give you some understanding as, of its presentation and symptoms, uh, and some of the epidemiology in relation to fistula. Um, I'd also hope to talk about some recent trends in the risk of fistula in the UK and the outcomes of, of treatment within the NHS, uh, and also to touch on issues of prevention. Um, I suspect we're unlikely to manage that within the available time, although if people want to raise it in Q&A and we have time for that, then that's fine by me. I will be jumping back and forth between high income and, uh, sorry, high income and low income uh, uh, settings. Uh, if you uh, lose track of which part of the planet we're on at any time, uh, then the icons in the top right of the screen there should help you to uh, uh, identify whether I'm talking about uh, low income countries, high income countries, or things that are of global relevance. Okay, um, just to check that I've got the uh, technology uh, working all right, and, and I'm not the least bit confident about that. Um, uh, I'm going to be using uh, Menti uh, a few times during the presentation. 
Um, so if you uh, have got a mobile phone, uh, it, you could uh, open Menti on that. Uh, if you uh, need to use a different uh, browser on your screen, then go ahead and, and do that without shutting yourself out of Zoom if you can. Um, if you put the code 40272035 in, um, and you should, with a bit of luck, uh, see question one, which says something like, what is a fistula? Um, oops, people are at it already. Um, I was going to set the clock on that, actually, just to make sure we don't spend uh, too long on that. That's too long a clock. I'm going to stop it before a minute's up. Uh, but if you could just uh, uh, submit your uh, uh, single best uh, answer there. Okay, we're getting a few answers in. The last time I saw it, there were 32 of you uh, online. So there's a lot of you scratching your heads there still. Okay, well, you've had uh, 30 seconds at that. So I'm actually gonna move on. Um, I've got uh, 15 responses uh, in there. Um, and uh, certainly the majority of you have got the uh, right answer that a fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelial surfaces. Uh, the other options that you had uh, were, the answers would have been um, uh, hernia, prolapse, sinus, and abscess. But the fourth one on the list there, uh, um, was the uh, correct one. So at least I'm happy the technology is working right and that both of you know at least uh, something about uh, what we're talking about. Of course, from that definition, you can uh, get fistulas virtually anywhere in the body that two epithelial surfaces uh, uh, occur in reasonable proximity. Um, but as far as uh, gynae fistulas are concerned, uh, we're interested in those in the pelvis. Um, between the anterior and middle compartments of the pelvis, uh, the posterior and middle compartments, and rarely directly between anterior and posterior compartments. But as far as urogenital fistula is concerned, which is uh, my brief for this afternoon, uh, it's fistula between the anterior and middle compartments. Just to show you a few examples in diagrammatic form, um, <coughs> The commonest type of fistula that we see, and this applies in both high and low income uh, settings, uh, is a vesical vaginal fistula between the posterior wall of the bladder and the anterior wall of the vagina. In the UK, these occur most typically following hysterectomy, and I'll say more about that uh, in a moment. As far as symptoms are concerned, obviously they present with urinary incontinence, urine finding the path of least resistance out from the bladder. The small fistulas, and we do in the UK, find them one or two millimeters in diameter at times, and the amount of leakage may be quite small, uh, limited to particular postures or particular uh, activities. With bigger fistulas, and you may see them four, five, six, seven centimeters in diameter at times, uh, then to all intents and purposes, the whole of the patient's urine output comes out through the vagina, so she leaks continuously day and night. We see fistulas higher, <coughs> excuse me, higher into the genital tract, um, vesico cervical uh, and vesico uterine. Um, most typically, these occur following cesarean section. In terms of symptoms, again, they present with urinary incontinence. Although vesico uterine fistula, on occasion, uh, menstrual blood from the uterus will pass through the fistula into the bladder, presenting with intermittent hematuria or menuria, as it's described. Now, of course, the ureters are pretty close by all of this uh, clockwork uh, and fistulas between the ureter and the vagina and cervix, uh, again, are uh, seen in association with hysterectomy and other pelvic operations from time to time. Then finally, um, the lowest from the urinary tract, urethrovaginal fistula, uh, again seen in both the high and low income settings. Uh, in the UK, they most often relate to surgery in uh, uh, low-income settings, uh, they do occur as a result of uh, uh, obstructed labor. Um, the symptoms that uh, accrue depend on the size of the fistula, 
how close it is to the bladder neck and what degree of uh, closure effect competence there is in the bladder neck. And you do sometimes see uh, urethral fistulas, urethrovaginal fistulas, uh, that present with no symptoms at all. Okay, um, can I get you to jump back to your uh, uh, Menti um, screen again, wherever you've got that, and get you to look at uh, question two now. Uh, I'm going to move on to be discussing some of the epidemiology of uh, uh, fistula. Uh, so just to check your understanding before we do that, uh, what is meant by the term incidence? Okay, I've got a few responses coming through there. Um, quite a variety of responses, has to be said. Although as the numbers increase, we're uh, certainly getting uh, the third option as being the most popular. Okay, well, I'm going to call a halt at that, as we do seem to have uh, um, the majority view as being that incidence is the number of newly diagnosed cases of a disease in a specified population over a specified period of time, uh, which is the uh, uh, correct option there. Um, now, if I just flip that over, you should now be able to see question three. Um, which says the term prevalence refers to, so perhaps I shouldn't have told you that option three was the right one uh, previously. Um, so which of these four options, and they are exactly the same four options, so you don't need to read them again, hopefully, um, is prevalence. Okay, that's interesting that somebody's marked the third option there. Okay, but obviously the vast majority have uh, correctly uh, spotted that prevalence refers to the total number of diagnosed cases of a disease in a specified population at a particular point in time. Okay, that's great. So if we just uh, get back then to... Uh, to the presentation. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, at least most of you have got the uh, appropriate uh, background information to proceed. Well, I'm going to talk about the incidence of, uh, of uh, fistula. In fact, uh, this particular slide uses a rather distorted definition of, of incidence, but these are data from hospital episode statistics that cover England and Wales. For um, uh, three separate operations, you, you don't need to focus on that, but these are all women who had a diagnosis of uh, urinary fistula uh, and had surgical treatment for that, and just shows the number of operations, and we can just look at the total uh, that were carried out over the last 30 years. And it averages about 150 procedures a year, of which 100 are primary operations. So a pretty tiny number, if you think that uh, the um, mid-urethral tapes that Ganesh was talking about earlier in the afternoon, um, prior to the uh, current uh, pause in activity, there would have been about 10,000 procedures, surgical procedures for stress incontinence uh, annually. Uh, so 150 fistulas in the UK is pretty small beer. Um, the blue line on here, which is on the second, the right-hand scale, is uh, fistula patients that we had referred into Newcastle. Uh, and they uh, increased gradually over the 30 years that I was responsible for the service, um, so that uh, ultimately we were averaging about 25 repairs a year or 25% of the uh, repairs carried out in, uh, in England and Wales anyway. <coughs> These weren't fistulas that were all generated in Newcastle, they were referred from all over the British Isles and 90% of them came from within a radius of about 150 miles of, of the city. I only mention that to point out that the remaining 75% of, of women with fistula in the UK uh, usually are dealt with at their local hospital, um, and in most cases those hospitals would have been dealing with one case a year or less 
You might just want to think about where you would send your mother if she had a fistula one of these days. Okay, just thinking about the etiology of the uh, cases that we see in, in Newcastle, this is a breakdown of, uh, of broad etiologies in the uh, series of cases that I dealt with in Newcastle. Uh, and you can see that uh, surgical uh, uh, etiology uh, accounts for about 70% of the cases that we see. This is uh, an example of a, a small fistula into the vaginal vault following uh, hysterectomy. This would be maybe two or three millimeters in diameter. You can barely even see it on the photograph, uh, but you can see that there's a fairly substantial jet of urine coming out of it and pooling in the back of the vagina in this speculum uh, blade here. If you look at uh, that same patient through a cystoscope, uh, this is the fistula here, uh, and they are pretty consistently uh, towards the uh, midline, or not close to the midline anyway, uh, and above the level of the ureters in the majority of cases. Now this is another vault fistula following uh, hysterectomy, in this case radical hysterectomy for cervix cancer, uh, a much bigger uh, uh, defect covering to all intents and purposes the whole of the trigone, so this is four or five centimeters in diameter. Um, you can see the ureteric orifices just in the edge of the fistula there and the bladder neck up at the top uh, here. I apologize for this slide, I don't expect you to read it, but this is simply to demonstrate that to all intents and purposes, any operation that we do in the pelvis can be and has been associated with fistula in this series of 345 uh, uh, surgical uh, fistulas. 70% of, uh, of these, um, or 50% of the total series, uh, relate to hysterectomy of various types, around 10% to prolapse and incontinence surgery, uh, and a similar number to other urological and coloproctological operations. Just to show a few examples, this is a small fistula at the level of the bladder neck in a woman who had an anterior repair of her prolapse. Uh, this is a young girl who developed fistula in the sulcus between the anterior vaginal wall, which is here, and the cervix, which is here. Um, you can barely see the fistula, which is tucked around the corner there, but again, on cystoscopic view, this is the hole from the bladder aspect, and you're looking down through into the vagina there. She actually had two uh, loop uh, excisions of her transformation zone for the investigation and treatment of uh, positive cervical smears. And finally, amongst these examples, this is a woman who had a mid-urethral tape uh, procedure. Um, and again, she has quite a small fistula here. There's a metal probe put into the fistula just to outline it, so you can't actually see the hole. All you see is the probe. Uh, but if you look into the urethra with a cystoscope or urethroscope, you can see the probe emerging, emerging through the other end of the fistula there, just below the bladder neck. We now move to, to look at the uh, group of obstetric fistula that we see in, uh, uh, in the UK. Um, you'll notice, uh, breaking them down a little bit further, that many of them have had obstetric interventions carried out, cesarean section, ruptured uterus following previous cesarean section, forceps, cesarean hysterectomy. So actually, a large proportion of these so-called obstetric fistulas have really a surgical etiology, uh, and it's probably more appropriate to look on them as that. So that rather than the 70% uh, surgical fistulas I've previously talked about, it's actually near 80% uh, that have uh, an associated uh, surgical intervention that almost certainly uh, contributed to the development of their fistula. Now that's in very marked contrast to what's seen in low-income countries. These are data from a series of two and a half thousand uh, women that I reviewed on behalf of Sister Alan Ward in southeast Nigeria some years ago. And you'll see that 80% of these uh, related to obstructed labor uh, and uh, just over 90% to obstetric causes overall. So these really couldn't be in greater contrast. 90% etiology in Nigeria. 80% surgical etiology uh, in the UK. 
just to show you that those are not just uh, flukes of the two series that I happen to have uh, uh, been involved in. Uh, this is a systematic review that I carried out with colleagues from Sheffield uh, a little while ago, looking at 15 studies from well-resourced countries, 34 studies from low-resourced countries, and to all intents and purposes, they show exactly the same patterns that uh, I'd shown for the two series that I was involved in more directly. As far as the incidence of uh, obstetric fistula is concerned, um, the figures are not desperately reliable, but one of the earliest estimates was from Waldeek and Amiyao, who work in, in northern Nigeria, uh, but produced uh, an estimate uh, of worldwide uh, incidence of about 50 to 100,000 new cases a year. Uh, as a, a modeling study produced uh, for the WHO, they came up with a figure of 82,000 new cases per year globally. Uh, and perhaps the most uh, scientifically robust data from prospective population studies in six West, West African countries came up with a figure of 33,500 new cases per year in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now, Sub-Saharan Africa has got a population of about 1 billion, so a seventh of the world's population, uh, but they're said to account for about 50% of the world's fistula. Uh, so that might suggest a figure of around 66, 67,000 uh, new cases globally. So quite a range in figures, uh, but uh, all in the same uh, order of magnitude. And um, Wild Deek's ori original guesstimate was, was probably not that far out. As far as prevalence is concerned, the global prevalence of untreated obstetric fistula uh, estimated uh, uh, figures 2 million, 3.5 million, uh, and again, the most robust data from national community-based surveys. Um, these are from um, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Malawi, uh, produced a figure of around 3.3 million. Uh, so again, a, a bit of variation, but, uh, but not that disparate, uh, in fact. Okay, now I've got another task for you. If uh, we can get you to uh, switch across to your... Uh, um, Menti uh, screen again, and go to question four. Uh, you need to do a bit of head scratching with this one, I suspect. Um, but what I want you to do is to work out what would be the global prevalence of fistula in 10 years time, assuming that some of the numbers I've just given you are correct. That's to say the global prevalence now is around 3.3 million. The incidence is around 66,000 new cases a year. 20,000 cases a year resolve spontaneously, which is uh, probably not far away from the truth, and 23,000 cases annually are successfully treated, which again is probably a reasonable estimate. That's based on uh, UNFPA data in relation to known uh, fistula centers. So are we talking about uh, um, a global prevalence in 10 years' time that will be the same as now, hugely greater, considerably smaller, or somewhere in between. Okay, I've got a very colorful looking pie chart on my screen here. It shows responses completely uh, spread between the uh, four options that I've given. Okay, it looks as though your thought processes are slowing up, so uh, uh, we'll call a halt on that. The correct answer, based on those figures, uh, would be, uh, well, the red one on the screen that I'm looking at, 3.6 million. That's to say, um, really uh, pretty close to what it is at the moment. Um, if we're, to all intents and purposes, getting rid of 43,000 cases a year, have a new incidence of 66,000 a year, then we're going to be increasing annually uh, by uh, 20 odd thousand. Um, so we've got a figure that's bigger than the current level, but not hugely so. 
And I suppose the message from this um, is that uh, uh, we can uh, take all of the uh, fistula surgeons in the world uh, and have them all working seven days a week uh, um, until uh, they no longer uh, survive. Um, and you actually won't get rid of the problem of fistula. Um, you might want to uh, think uh, subsequently about what the best way of getting rid of it uh, might be. Okay, I'm just going to say a little bit more about obstructed labor. As I mentioned before, 90% um, of fistula in low income countries uh, have an obstetric etiology, probably 80% of them relate to obstructed labor, but what's the, uh, the mechanism here? Well, of course, during the process of normal labor, <coughs> the fetal presenting part, the head in this case, descends into the pelvis. Uh, and in doing so, compresses the soft tissues of the pelvis against the bony structures, pubic symphysis at the front, uh, sacrum at, at the back. Now, if that goes on for a few hours, even up to 12 hours in normal labor, then no harm is going to accrue. Um, but if the baby becomes obstructed in the pelvis uh, and uh, the uterus is continuing to contract against that for not only hours, but in some cases, several days, then <clears throat> the soft tissues are going to become ischemic. If you examine a patient like this uh, uh, after she's delivered, maybe two or three days after delivery, uh, then this is what you might see. Uh, this is a speculum in the back of the vagina here, cervix here, anterior vaginal walls, just to probe lifting the vaginal skin up. The white area here is essentially dead tissue. Uh, and if you examine this woman again two or three weeks later, then this is what you see. The slough has separated, come away, and left the fistula, in this case, at the bladder neck level. Apart from obstructed labor, there are a number of other physical factors that contribute to the development of uh, fistula. Accidental injury, that's cesarean section, forceps, um, destructive operations. Traditional surgical practices may be of, of relevance, uh, FGM in its various forms. Criminal abortion certainly is of relevance in many low-income countries, as is gender-based violence. There are also a number of biosocial factors, malnutrition, untreated infection in childhood, osteomalacia. Early childbearing all mean that when uh, women go into labor, then their pelvis may be incompletely developed to cope with the process. And there are, of course, a whole range of cultural factors, the generally subservient role of women in many uh, societies in low-income countries in particular, poor edu educational opportunities afforded to the girl child, early marriage, lack of contraception, high parity, limited antenatal care or even poor uptake of antenatal care when it's provided, care and labor by unskilled attendants or, or relatives, and a general mistrust of, of healthcare services, uh, which are all too often looked on as places that you go to die rather than places that you go to receive healthcare. So a whole range of, uh, of factors that may contribute to fistula development uh, uh, in low income countries. Uh, finally, I'd just like to share with you um, a case of a young girl uh, who I came across in Northern Nigeria a few years ago. Um, we'll call her Tulatu, although that's not her real name. Um, she was 16 years old when I uh, first met her. Um, she'd had FGM, we're not quite sure how extensive, as a young child, five or six years of age. She was married when she was 12 and pregnant within a year. When she went into labor, she was managed by a local traditional birth attendant and was in labor for five days and then delivered a macerated stillborn infant. A few days later, she became completely incontinent of both urine and stool. There was a hospital not very far away, um, and she uh, underwent a defunctioning colostomy, which improved her fetal incontinence somewhat, not completely, uh, but somewhat, um, but did nothing for her urinary incontinence, but they had nothing else to offer. She was actually unable to walk at that stage after her uh, delivery and required uh, intensive rehabilitation over the next uh, six months, uh, this being due to bilateral sacral plexus injuries uh, as a result of her obstructed labor. And it was two years later that she managed to get herself to a fistula camp at the referral hospital. 
Now this is Tonatu at the age of, uh, of 16. This is a perineum. Uh, you can see her colostomy here. She's got a plastic bag covering that uh, since there are no uh, um, um, stoma bags available uh, in her area. Um, there's a small remnant of clitoris here. There are no labia. <clears throat> there's no urethra. There's no posterior wall to her bladder or anterior vaginal wall. There's no anterior wall to her rectum or posterior vaginal wall. So you're looking straight into her rectum here and straight into her bladder here. This little band of scar here is all that remains of her cervix. Difficult to imagine what sort of injury that is. If you just look uh, in diagrammatic form over here, um, she has lost her urethra completely. She has a massive vesicle vaginal fistula. She has bilateral ureteric fistulas. She's a massive rectovaginal fistula. She's got scarring in her uterus. Uh, and she has essentially a field injury uh, circumferentially around the whole of her pelvis um, of this size. Now, what she really needs by way of treatment is probably either a double diversion, an ileal conduit to divert her urinary tract, as Ganesh was talking about earlier on, uh, along with an end colostomy, <coughs> or alternatively, uh, a major reconstructive procedure, bringing her large bowel down to produce uh, essentially a perineal colostomy um, and reconstructing her bladder and urethra out of usually bowel and appendix. Uh, and uh, implanting uh, an artificial sphincter as well. And neither of those options are uh, available, uh, and neither would be acceptable in the environment in which she lives. We did try to do a reconstruction um, using skin flaps to create urethra and anterior vaginal wall here, and a skin flap from here to create a posterior vaginal wall and reconstruct her anal sphincter. But that sort of surgery, um, whilst it may improve the anatomy, you, you may say that's not the case, although this is taken immediately after her operation, um, it may improve the anatomy, um, but functionally, um, she's never going to have completely normal urinary or bowel function. It's unlikely that she will have normal sexual intercourse. Uh, she certainly will never menstruate again and will not have any more babies. She uh, exemplifies what's uh, come to be called the obstetric fistula complex, which is not just an ischemic field injury affecting the whole of the pelvis, uh, but is a nutritional disease, has neurological, musculoskeletal, dermatological, urinary, gynecological, socioeconomic, and psychological elements to it. Um, Tulatu experienced, to all intents and purposes, all of these, with the sole exception of suicide, as far as we know. Um, that's probably an appropriate place to leave things. I had hoped to talk about recent trends in fistula risk in the UK and say a bit more about prevention, um, but it's probably time to draw things to an end. Um, but before I do that, can I get you to just one more time jump back to your uh, um, mentee screen and... You should, I think, now be able to get to question five. Um, and I'd like you to make a text entry there. If there was one thing you could propose to eradicate obstetric fistula, what would it be? I'm not sure how these results will actually appear on the screen, if indeed they will. But... Uh, Obstetric care in lower middle income countries. Excellent. Early recognition training and campaigns. There must be somebody else out there. Education for both healthcare professionals and patients. Further education of communities about harms of FGM. Education, education, education. provide resources and training to low and middle income countries so they can develop and improve their own workforce, cessation of harmful traditional practices. <clears throat> 
timely access to obstetric care. All of these things are hugely relevant, but it's good to see that the most commonly appearing theme is, is education. And, and I would have to say, I, I think that is absolutely crucial to uh, uh, getting rid of obstetric fistula. If we provided uh, secondary education to all uh, girls in the world, um, then fistula would ultimately disappear because they would ensure that it does much more effectively than the current systems do. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much for that. And uh, that's me done, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hilton. That was a very interesting talk. Um, we are uh, kind of at the end, I think, but if you wouldn't mind a few questions. Sure. Um, so- Only I can see you, there we are. First up, uh, what work uh, is going to is going on between medics and those in politics mm. uh, to try and improve this issue? Um, I'm not sure I'd really know the answer to that. Uh, uh, currently, I did uh, previously when I was uh, uh, working with uh, UNFPA, um, but currently I don't I don't know. It is it is a, a really a, you're talking about low and middle income countries. I'm, I'm assuming um, it is uh, a really difficult issue. Um, uh, there certainly have been um, in uh, a number of areas um, uh, fairly uh, high profile um, politicians um, who. Uh, uh, have uh, made it a, a personal challenge to try and deal with the issues of fistula within their own areas or within their own countries. But I'd say more often than not, it's, it's the wives that have had the drive to do that rather than the politicians them, themselves. Um, but um, uh, as far as direct uh, clinician to politician um, uh, involvement, um, currently I can't, I can't really answer that. Uh, thank you so much. And do you have any recommendations or resources we can use to further educate ourselves? So I think this would probably be aimed at an audience of kind of medical students and pre-specialty OBS and gynae trainees. Um, to educate yourselves about fistula in particular? Um, um, I, I assume so. About, yeah. Um, Okay, well, there is a, a wealth of literature out there. From a scientific point of view, it is uh, certainly not of, of the highest quality, um, but uh, there are a number of texts uh, specifically devoted to fistula, and, and uh, I would say most of them to obstetric fistula rather than fistula in, in high income countries. Um, if you want me to submit a list of uh, texts that you might look for, I could certainly do that. What's the easiest way to get that out there? To send it to you? Uh, sure, and we can put that on the event page. I'm sure people would find yeah, it. Yeah, sure. That's not a problem. Oh, thank you so much. And um, a few more. Um, are there any innovations in the area uh, which may help, uh, uh, which may help, uh, you know, reduce the prevalence of your genital fistulas uh, in low and middle uh, income settings? Um. I think the quick answer to that is, is, is probably no, uh, and, and it, it really requires political action at, at the highest level to, uh, to make the major societal changes that would be required for, for that to, to happen. Uh, the UNFPA, um, uh, I think somewhere in the early 2000s established uh, a program uh, uh, that they described as uh, the eradication of, of fistula. Um, uh, their first effort at that was was to set up a surgical camp, and and that is just no way to eradicate this this problem. Um, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, surgical innovations, no, the techniques that we use now are the same techniques that have been used for uh, 150 years, uh, to all intents and purposes. Um, there, there certainly are some. Um, interesting uh, developments and I say I was uh, hoping that I would have time to 
talk about some of the things that we've been, uh, I've been doing with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but they, they related to UK practices rather than to, uh, uh, to, to developing world practices. But there is some frightening information to suggest uh, that the risk of getting a fistula in the UK is currently increasing. Um, I don't really understand why that is. Uh, my own supposition um, is that it is because as the number of hysterectomies that are done declines because of advances in medical treatment of menstrual problems, for example, um, uh, the uh, number of uh, cases that are available for uh, training uh, declines. Uh, so that when trainees embark on independent consultant practice, uh, their level of uh, uh, experience uh, is significantly uh, less than it has, has been in the past. Uh, the cases that do require to be operated on uh, are perhaps uh, the most complex end of the, the spectrum. Um, and that puts uh, patients at considerable risk, I would have to say. The numbers are tiny, though. Uh, so they're never going to hit the headlines, uh, but your risk of, of getting a VVF um, now is probably um, 50 to 100 percent higher than it was um, a few years ago, 10 years ago, um, when you have a hysterectomy. And the risk of ureteric injury may be uh, more than two to three times higher. Mm -hmm. Um, and perhaps uh, kind of to finish off, um, what inspired you uh, to go into this area and, uh, and to go abroad and to practice uh, in Africa? Um, yeah, that's a, a, an interesting one. Um, uh, in my first uh, SHO job um, in Oxford and Guyana, that would be, I suppose, a, an F2 job as far as you guys are concerned. Um, I... Um, worked with a very senior consultant gynecologist who was trained not just in uh, uh, in obs and gynae but also in general surgery um, and I was in the operating theater with him uh, uh, one day when he made the cardinal error of doing a hysterectomy on his own secretary. During the course of the operation he divided one of her ureters um, and uh, I'm afraid just sort of fell apart despite his, his great experience. Um, he uh, managed to find the local urologist who came in and, and fixed the ureter without any problem. But during the course of her post-operative course, she also developed a visco vaginal fistula. Uh, and, and I decided from that experience alone um, that if I was going to be involved in obs and gynae, I had to get some more training in urology and general surgery. Um, and, and, and sort of from there on, um, urogynecology and fistula in particular became a particular uh, uh, passion, I, uh, I suppose. Um, and if you're going to get involved in fistula surgery, um, you're not going to get very far by doing that in the UK because the numbers are, are so small. Um, uh, you need to go to uh, work in a low income country um, if you want to get reasonable experience in, in a modest period of time. Um, so I uh, went to um, Southeast Nigeria initially and, and made a number of visits, never particularly long visits, then three months was the longest uh, time that I had, but uh, every few years I, I would have made a visit to, uh, uh, to Nigeria and since I've retired I've been going, uh, well, been once to Nigeria, more often to Uganda um, a couple of times a year. Hmm. Uh, off to lockdown of course. Well, um, we've had a, a really long and interesting afternoon. Um, thank you to all our speakers uh, who are still here or who have left already. And thank you, Paul, so much for your talk. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to finish here. Um, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to uh, email uh, Busog uh, and we will forward them uh, on uh, to the speakers. So now onto the final matter, which is the feedback forms. Um, I think the link should be in the chat now um so if you would like a certificate we would love appreciate it if you could fill in the feedback form and um thank you so much for attending our webinars this year um and we hope to be back next year with more bye bye